Okay. Um, well, what I'm going to talk about is uh, two different courses that I taught on uh, in the last year. Uh, one uh, was not written by me, it was produced by Minerva University. And it's a fully online uh, synchronous course, and I'll explain how this works. But I'll also then explain how it kind of motivated me and inspired me to try different things in my own course that I've been created about digital literacy. And uh, kind of changed from a fully online synchronous course to a blended course, trying to adopt some of the same pedagogical approaches. Before I get to talking about the two courses, uh, just quickly go over and explain the different modes of delivery that are possible now because of technology. And of course there's face-to-face, -face, but um, I'll go through these others very quickly. I mean, you pull the online synchronous course, so that's making use of things like Zoom. I think now we're all familiar with what, well maybe not all of us, but we're familiar with what Zoom is, conferencing tools, video conferencing tools. Uh, and for this course that I taught on multimodality, making use of another platform called the Minerva uh, uh, Forum. Fully online asynchronous courses that might be through Moodle, through uh, Canvas or Blackboard, making use of discussion forums, Google Documents, that sort of thing. Things that are not time dependent or immediate in real time. You can do a combination of a fully online course. Parts of it might be asynchronous, parts of it might be asynchronous. Or you can do blended, and blended comes in various forms, right? 50% face-to-face, 50% -face, 50 online, or it could be 60% online, 40 and so on. I think the number usually is, it, it's blended, they say if it's 30% minimum online, 70 for face-to-face. -face. Once you get more face-to-face, -face, it becomes a web-based, supported face-to-face -face type of teaching. All right, so just keep in mind those different modes of delivery. Also, I'm going to very briefly introduce the Community of Inquiry uh, framework. I'm not going to go into too, too much detail about what it is, but I will draw your attention to the three main components, which are social presence, cognitive presence, and teaching presence. Okay? Because they're quite important if you want to design uh, different ways using different modes of delivery and for uh, your pedagogical design. But, Social presence is basically the ability of participants to identify with the community, communicate properly in a trusted environment, and develop interpersonal relationships by way of projecting the individual personalities. So basically, how are you allowing for people to have their own identity in the classroom, be able to relate to other people, and express themselves and connect in different ways? Right? So how is your course enabling social presence? Cognitive presence is basically to the extent to which learners are able to construct and confirm their understanding of something. Right? How is the knowledge, or in our case, the language, the skill set that we're trying to learn, how are they able to construct meaning, construct new objects, uh, or artifacts, written, spoken, and how are they able to confirm their understanding and reflect on what they're learning? And then teaching presence. And this isn't just the teacher themselves, this is actually in the course design. So uh, your tasks, your engagement prompts, the syllabus, in online learning, everything from step-by-step -step modules, the steps of what to do, uh, when to watch a video, when to take a quiz, that's all the teaching presence. Okay, so that's all there. And I'll, I'll come back to this uh, to explain things. But first, I'm gonna illustrate what the fully online synchronous course of Minerva was like, so that I can tell you how I've adapted that into one of our language courses. All right. Don't try to read this. Uh, the reason why I put this up is because I want to illustrate how complex the Minerva curriculum is. And the Minerva curriculum has four, four first-year courses, or foundational courses. Right. This is the one that I taught on multimodal, on multimodal communications. Right. This is just the first semester. Okay. These are other courses in the curriculum for Minerva. And each course has what they call HCs or competencies. Instead of intended learning outcomes, students must learn certain competencies by the end of the course. 
And what they've done in Minerva is they've mapped out the competencies all across the four foundational courses and then continuously up to the four year curriculum. Right? So in multimodality, the competencies that my students in, after the first semester were supposed to learn were things like interpretive lens, context, critique, connotation, source equality, organization, thesis, evidence-based, composition, audience. Later on, they learned uh, purpose, uh, they learned, they, they returned to connotation, they learned uh, things like medium. Right? So these are all competencies that are required to be a good communicator in a multimodal context. Later on in the other courses, these will pop up. So what students learn is they actually learn that connotation is important, not just in my language course. Connotation is important in empirical analysis too. So I learn this competency in a different context. Okay. This is what they give for all of the different competencies, a very clear five scale rubric. right? description of what that competency means, and then examples of how we teach and how we grade it. So it's pretty uh, detailed uh, about what we're trying to learn or what we're trying to teach the students. And this competency, for example, for connotation will be the same throughout their entire four-year curriculum. Okay. Why is this important? Why am I talking about this? It's because in the synchronous platform, this looks like a lot of different um, web conferencing tools, is in the technology, it's actually embedded right into the lessons. All right. So here I am, this is actually about three weeks ago, uh, they've all returned, these are some of my international students, they've returned uh, to their home countries, and uh, we're, I'm teaching from home, and we're talking about uh, utilitarian considerations at this point, and I want to grade them on connotation. On this timeline, this student is speaking. So it's this student speaking right now. Right? And he's speaking. And I can actually grade him on this timeline on what he said and what, how well he's aware of connotation in that instance. Okay. So let me quickly describe what a, how a typical lesson goes in this classroom. Not sure. Right? Oh, it's a that screen only. Uh, 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 uh,
right? So they're all they're sent off into different breakout groups, different rooms, and I can visit them in each of these rooms, and I can even listen to them. And they can't see me, but I can listen to them. Right? When they come out of the breakout groups, I call on each individual. Oh, thank you. Uh, so we have the introduction, we have the prep poll, and then we have a breakout group. I hope this comes off. <laughs> right? Which is basically activity one. Right? And then after the breakout, we have a debrief of the breakout where I get the students to report on what they talk about in the breakout group. And again, all cold calling, it could be a relay. I'll say, okay, uh, Sarah, please present what you guys did in your breakout group. And she'll present it. And I said, okay, thank you very much. Gian, do you agree with what they said? How would you have done things differently? And so on. Right? Then we go into a second breakout group. That will be an activity two. And there will be a debrief as well. Then we have a reflection poll <coughs> afterwards. And what this reflection poll does is it ties in what they've done in the previous activities. Right? The prep poll is really to see whether or not they got the readings correct, right? whether they understand the readings. The reflection poll is designed to see if now they can go in breadth about it, go in deeper. Right? So now I'm no longer looking at how correct they are answering, but how they're able to discuss things in more depth, more breadth. Okay. And hopefully these activities prepare them for that. And then we end with a closure. Okay. And usually for the closure, I'll call on the student, and it's just a simple thing. Uh, what's one of your key takeaways from this lesson? And then they'll answer. And then again, I'll do a relay with other students. Okay. So that's a typical lesson in an asynchronous le uh, or sorry, in a synchronous lesson where I'm cold calling them, and they're used to it. Because the system records everything and timestamps every time someone talks, I can go in to activity one and grade them on how well they exhibited those competencies in the asynchronous or sorry, in the synchronous lesson. Now, none of this would be possible without the platform. So this is where the pedagogy and the, and the technology really work hand in hand. So in a sense, in this case, we have active learning, which is the cold calling. I have them constantly talking to each other through the activities. Um, I'm not doing a lot of talking. They're doing most of the talking. I only facilitate and interject when I think something uh, needs to be said. Right? They are used to the cold calling. They're used to being participants. So there's that social presence in that sense. Right? We have the cognitive presence, which is the habits of mind and the competencies that Minerva uses. But it's also in the assessments, the constant assessing that I have to do each week by saying, yes, you, you, you've exhibited this competency well, right, and so on. But then there's also the teaching presence. It's not just me being there on the screen, but it's also the, um, uh, the design. It's the clear design that students expect every time. So we have all of that in Minerva. Blended learning, which is what I want to transfer what I've learned in the Minerva course into a blended learning course. I don't have this platform that allows me to record everything. I don't do everything synchronously online. I'm going to do the online component asynchronously through Canvas, and the synchronous part will be in class face to face. So, how can I take a similar format, because it worked really well in Minerva, but with different technology? adapted for this new course. So the course that I designed for this is called Media and Introduction to Digital Literacy. It's really geared towards teaching people how to communicate effectively online, but also be a little bit more critical of what they really need to read online. Right? In Canvas, it looks like this. It has the modules from week one defining, whoops, from week one defining uh, digital literacies to multi-literacies, multi-modality, down to online language, critical digital literacy, and so on. Right. My classroom was like this. I, I had 48 students in the class. So I had a room like this with the tables. 
how I ended up doing this is I treated each table as a student. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. Because each week I wanted something similar where the students would come in, they had to show that they've done the online work. I had a prep poll and I used different tools like Kahoot's. Although now, Jay, those tools that you showed me, I might start using those as well, or I can see some use for those. But the point is, I, I had some sort of technology that allowed me to do a prep poll to, to test whether or not they did their work, and I could accept it. They enjoyed using Kahoot. Then I did breakups. Canvas allows us to create groups in Google Documents very easily. So going back to why I assigned each table as a student, I said, okay, you're Google document one and Google document two, Google document three. So each one would be a different Google document. And the students would have that in the Canvas website already. They would have a task. These, each table was acted as a breakout group. They would complete the task on Google documents. And then I would ask each table to present their results in the classroom. Right? Sometimes it would be just one activity, sometimes it would be two activities. I would have a similar thing with the debrief, get them to say, well, what did you learn from this? Yeah. And then I would use a reflection poll as well. The reflection poll would be just a simple Google form with a question and get them five minutes to write into the Google form. And then I would show the results and post them into the canvas so after class they could read them as well. Other forms of social presence that I allowed were our discussion forums. Each table, became a group in the discussion forums. And each week, someone had to lead a discussion. Right, so this was part of their online work. Right, and it was easier to manage than just one giant discussion forum. So there were different groups. Each group had four students. And over the semester, at least one student led one discussion. And that discussion would be based on one of the topics in the modules. Okay. And then they had to create some artifact like a podcast which is what part of the course is about okay so what does this mean for pedagogical innovation or is it just about innovative pedagogy that's one thing i want to think about because we have different modes of delivery right? i think we can apply a similar framework to different modes of delivery we just need to make sure that the social presence we need to make sure there's cognitive presence and teaching presence. In my course, I made sure that every lesson students were aware of the ILO, and uh, I used the curriculum and course design as a teaching presence. But you can think about across, why it's not just pedagogical innovation, it's also across the four-year curriculum or three-year curriculum in language education. Right? If we adopt, say, competency-based learning, and each course that we have focuses on different competencies. But by the end of the curriculum, four years, they have to do some major project where they exhibit all of the competencies. Or maybe uh, at the end of a the year, they have to do some project to exhibit some of the competencies. But the main point, oops, can't go back. Oh, I see it there, but I don't see it here. There we go. Okay. Uh, I guess the main point is we can see that, like from Jay's presentation and from different delivery modes, we have the technology, but we we have to avoid just adding it on as an add-on. It has to be a part of the curriculum design. It has to be a part of pedagogical design or, or, or the tasks that we do in class, and plus uh, assessments as well. You have to think of it all together in that sense. So that's basically the point I want to talk about there. Any questions? Quick question, Tom. The online, what, how long does that take? 90 minutes. Yeah, so it's a 90 minute class. Um, sometimes it feels inflexible because the lesson plan is embedded right into the system and I can't deviate. It even has a timer up at the top top of the corner that tells me 
how many more minutes I have left for the class. And I can time myself so I can see, well, I have 30 minutes for this activity. And then when it gets past 30 minutes, the timer turns red. <laughs> There's a lot of pressure. I have to admit that the cognitive load is demanding at the beginning for something like this, right? Because you're not just thinking about the content you're teaching, you're not thinking about the teachers or the, sort of the students or the interaction in that. You're also thinking about the timeline and the, and the technology. But once you get used to that, you don't even think about it on this one. And actually get used to it. Um, I taught two classes in this platform, uh, multimodality and complex systems. And so I'm with the students for the second year. It's the same cohort. I've seen them grow. Um, and they they refer to themselves as Minervans. <laughs> so they actually, I, I think the curriculum works quite well. How many times have you had a chance to run the digital literacy course? Once. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I ran it once last year and I'll run it again this spring. With some alterations? Or? I'll, I'll have some alterations. Yeah, yeah. I think I'll use. I'm going to embed more reflection polls. I did the reflection polls all the time. All right, they, they worked really well. Uh, and I'll rethink some of the pre-class tasks, some of the breakout tasks that I did. But as a general format, it worked quite well. Right, to run the face-to-face -face class. Do you have a control group that you can compare these students to and see any differences between? <laughs> uh, Minerva is fully online there, it's, it's different, it's part of a special scholarship program that USD has, so I wouldn't know what you would compare them to. It would be nice. I was just wondering, uh, the prep poll and the reflection poll, are they both assessed? Like from, uh, or so, yeah, in the Minerva course, I have, this is, it is a lot of work actually, Minerva. We have to grade them every week. And um, the, the instructors, we sit down and we determine, do we grade them on the prep poll? Do we grade them on the reflection poll? Or do we grade them on the activity? And we try to do a combination of all. Right? So by the end of the semester, they'll have up to, I think, 20 different grades. And they're, they're very minimal. Like they're, 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 low. they're not weighted heavily, but they add up. And by the end, the system, what it does is it actually shows them, right, your average score for this competency is four out of five, but your average score for this competency is only two. You might want to work on this competency a little bit more, right? Because I should have graded them on all these competencies numerous times for the whole semester. So they're getting constant feedback on these competencies. It's a lot different than what we're doing right now, I think, in a lot of our language courses, right? Where students just get feedback in one assignment, in the middle of the term, one assignment at the end of the term. Here, but here, they get feedback for the entire semester. Of course, there's a cost benefit to that, and the cost is it's a little bit more work on the teacher's side. But the system allows for that work. Do students feel under a lot of pressure, though? Because it seems like they speak, but they're being assessed for whatever they say. I mean, suppose they stumble over their words or don't express themselves well. You know, it's interesting. They, because we set that tone at the very beginning of last year, they're used to it. They know that they have to listen to each other. They know they have. They can't get away with not doing the work. Right? There are times when I'll say, "Cherry, what do you think of this?" And she'll, instead of saying nothing, she'll say, "I'm sorry, I just don't know." And then I'll move we move on to the next student, right? But of course, she'll get graded low if I'm grading that activity. So she might get away with it, she might not get away with it. Thanks, John.